Hello everyone and welcome to Slash Film Daily for Friday, July 19th, 2019. On today's episode, we are at San Diego Comic-Con 2019 edition and we have experienced the first day. We're going to tell you all about it in just a few seconds. This is Slash Film Editor-in-Chief Peter Serretta. And joining me on today's podcast is Slash Film Managing Editor Jacob Paul. Hello, hello. And writer Y Trend Bui. Hey everyone. So we are here. Again, uh, we, we have experienced Thursday. This is the first day of this edition of Comic-Con. It started out kind of slow, if I do say so myself. Yeah, this is a strangely empty day. There was only one major studio panel, maybe two if you include HBO, but it's definitely the, one of the quieter Thursdays you've seen in quite some time. Yeah, I know you rushed over to Hall H to cover the Terminator Dark Fate panel, and you sent us a photo of, like, the room half empty. Yeah, I mean, it filled up towards the end as people started realizing they can get in, but with 10 minutes to go, there were literally thousands of seats left in Hall H. Yeah, and I was on the show floor earlier today to record a video, and boy, was that place busy. So all the people that weren't in Hall H were on the show floor. Um, but let's talk about Terminator. I know... Uh, they released something online, right? From that, yeah, they released a uh, brief featurette that they also showed during the panel. But the panel also got what seemed to be an extended trailer. I'm assuming it's a longer version that will be online, you know, soon enough. But it was that plus, you know, a panel with the cast and director Tim Miller and Arnold Schwarzenegger and Linda Hamilton were there. So it, was, it definitely felt like an event, even if the room wasn't as packed as usual. Yeah, it, we we learned some big news. Uh, one of the original cast members returning. Yeah, it's, it's interestingly, uh, James Cameron wasn't there, but James Cameron did do a live stream from the Avatar 2 set where he said that Edward Furlong will be back as John Connor. Uh, Edward Furlong, of course, played John Connor in Terminator 2, didn't return for any of the other sequels, uh, but he's nowhere to be seen in the footage. So the extent of his role is unknown at this time. In fact, he's not in the footage, suggests maybe it's a brief appearance, it's probably a cameo. And James Cameron announced it in a strange way, too, with kind of an offhand. Uh, mention. He's like, oh yeah, Edward Furlong is back. Yeah, and it, I, from what I've heard from my inside source is that it, he might not be reprising his role as John Connor. I don't know. We'll have to, we'll have to wait and see yeah, for that yeah. one. I, I'm, I'm wondering if, if it's like a digital recreation of Edward Furlong, honestly. <laughs> yeah. This digital version of Edward Furlong is in this movie. Yeah. Well, the other thing is, I don't think, if they're not going to show him in the trailers, I don't think anybody's going to recognize him as, have you seen him lately? I have not. He does not look anything like. Yeah, I was Googling images of him after this announcement, and I was like, he doesn't look great. He doesn't look camera ready, I will just say. Yeah. No, no, that's for sure. Okay, so the footage you guys did see, what did you think? What did you see? Uh, after being really, really um, underwhelmed by the first trailer that was online, I kind of went into this panel expecting the worst, and what we saw looked pretty good. Ready, she? Yeah, I was yeah. surprised, too. I think the uh, first two trailers tried to hold back a little bit too much what the, the Terminator-ness of it all, but here um, in this footage, that we finally hear Linda Hamilton ask Sarah Connor say... I'll be back. And that was the thing that drew cheers. That was the thing that was like, oh, it grabbed my attention. Uh, I think the most important thing when you talk about uh, from this footage, the thing that um, people don't seem to believe it when I tell them, is that, uh, that Arnold Schwarzenegger's new Terminator is named Carl. Carl! <laughs> <laughs> that is funny. Uh, is that something we didn't know before? Is he, He's playing a whole new character? He's playing a whole new character, a whole new Terminator named Carl, and... The footage we saw opens with a uh, extended version of a scene we see in the trailers. And by the way, it should be mentioned that you have a dog named Carl. I do have a dog named Carl. This is very strange. Uh, so the, the, the footage began with a uh, Mexico car chase uh, through the deserts of Mexico, where uh, Mackenzie Davis's character Grace is defending uh, two kids being hunted by a Terminator by G- Gabriel Luna. And it's just, uh, Gabriel Luna is driving a semi truck, and they're in a like pickup, and it's this big fight scene. Uh, ends with both cars crashing. And Sarah Connor arriving to save the day with a machine gun and a rocket launcher, casually blowing up a bunch of Terminators, then saying, I'll be back for grabbing a shotgun and walking off with it. So it's a, it's a, it was a cool crowd pleasing thing. It's very big. It's very slick looking. I know that Tim Miller, the director who did Deadpool previously, has made a big deal in the panel about how he wants to return to the grimy grittiness of the original films. And I don't see that here. It looks like a very slick modern blockbuster, but it is impressively staged. I am, I'm on board for it, but I also don't, 
see the DNA of, you know, the, the first two films, which I think are stone cold masterpieces. But the hints of actual plot come in after that, where, uh, we see Sarah Connor essentially in a, in a bedroom laying out her life story for the other characters. And it was especially interesting that Grace, Mackenzie Davis' character, who's from the future, who's come to protect Danny, uh, for and she's reasons. also a Terminator. Uh, yeah, uh, she's an enhanced human, meaning that she's, uh, mostly human, but has, like, cybernetic enhancements to make her able to fight Terminators. And she's, she hasn't heard of Sarah Connor. Like, Sarah Connor has to, like, rem- tell her, I prevented Judgment Day. We, I saved three billion lives. You're welcome. And <laughs> combining this with what Tim Miller said in the panel later on, which is that in the Terminator universe, they decided that there's one timeline, there's no multiverses, which you do in the past always affects the future. The impression seems to be that while Sarah Connor prevented Judgment Day, all she did was postpone the inevitable as, and is now spending her, spent her entire life, the past 30 years, fighting off waves upon waves of Terminators who were just always coming back trying to keep things happening. All she's doing is just pushing it further back and fighting a never-ending battle. She has a line which is like, my name is Sarah Connor, I hunt Terminators. <laughs> so her role seems to be like she's gotten very bitter, she's very weary, she's very untrustworthy, and the war's always changing because every time she, you know, makes progress and saves the right person, the, the future adapts and has to find somebody new, in this case, this woman, Danny, who she's trying to rescue. And that brings us to Carl, the Terminator. Wait, 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 before you get to Carl, yeah. and I, I almost hate to open these doors, Jacob, okay. but I know a lot of people hate the end of Terminator 3 because it kind of presents this idea that um, even – is it Terminator 3 or Terminator – yeah, Terminator 3, where it presents this idea that the, the future is inevitable, that you can't stop – it happened. It's basically the same thing you're saying. It's just you're just delaying it in a way. Would, it happens in a different way. I would disagree to the extent that Rise of the Machines ends by saying, um, "Ha ha, you're screwed. No, no matter what, hope is useless." Whereas the, the, the setup here seems to be that Sarah Connor has not given up hope and will never give up hope. She's going to keep the fight going. Whereas Terminator Three just said, "Oh, you're screwed." And I think for to me that's the difference. And yeah. That's why I'm hoping that you know uh, Sarah Connor's always going to be fighting to change fate. Whereas where Terminator Three just said the fight's useless. Yeah. But Carl, talk about Carl. Um, he's an older Terminator, like we have learned in Genesis, Terminator's age. He's living um, in the woods in this like really nice cabin. He has a dog, and he's been living amongst humans for long enough that people think he's a human being named Carl. And uh, Grace knows he's a good guy of some kind, but Sarah Connor is incredibly wary of him and tries to kill him. And has a great moment where she says, um, along the lines of. One is all over, I'm going to kill you. The Terminator's, I can't remember Terminator's line, but his response is essentially, yeah, I get that. It's fine. Um, <laughs> and there's, and there's a whole bunch of action going on. The last chunk of the footage is entirely action. Lots of fighting, lots of shooting. A great moment where Carl uh, grabs Sarah Connor and holds her against him while machine gun fire hits his back repeatedly. And Sarah Connor just snarls at him, don't you touch me. <laughs> and then pulls out a machine gun and fires back at the people shooting at them. It, it looks very big. It looks very silly. But it, looks, it looks very fun. It looks... I, I, I am ready to like a Terminator movie again, and I'm ready to accept that nothing's ever going to top the first two for what they are. And if this is just a competent action movie with characters I like, and I think that this direction with Sarah Connor, this, you know, letting her age tell so much, inform how much who she is, is the right direction. Uh, H.G., how, how cool was Linda Hamilton on this panel? She was the coolest. And there was one thing I really liked that she said on the panel where she was trying to get back into fighting shape for Sarah Connor. And she was struggling a little bit because she is older. And um, she said one day she woke up and she realized that uh, she doesn't have to um, go back to how she was because she's better now than how she was. And I thought that was very powerful. And uh, there was a great moment between... Um, Natalia uh, uh, Reyes. Reyes and Linda and Linda Hamilton, where she basically said, "You're my role model, and I want to be like you." And uh, they both got very emotional, and I think that was such a great, um, <laughs> so like depiction of their relationship, but also how Linda Hamilton is uh, portraying this character as an older character. Do yeah. either of you feel the fingerprints of James Cameron on this, or it was he just away doing Avatar and? You put his name on this. Nothing in this footage said James Cameron. There's literally no... Go back and rewatch those first two Terminator movies, and they are James Cameron movies through and through. He has a very distinctive mark as a filmmaker, and it's not present at all here. I, but even I, in concepts or ideas? Not at all. No? I wouldn't, okay. I, if you're excited for James Cameron, I, I would temper those. 
but it does look like an incredibly competent Tim Miller directed sci-fi action movie with Linda Hamilton and Arnold Schwarzenegger looking really, really good in it. But it sounds like both of you are a little bit more excited to see this now after seeing this. Uh, significantly film. more excited. Okay, uh, we've done ten minutes on Terminator, so we got to move on. There was a surprise at the end of this panel. Yeah, HD. Uh, I think you should take this one. Yeah. So Conan O'Brien suddenly walked on stage after the Terminator Dark Fate panel ended, and he said that. And he gave Jacob a Funko Pop <laughs> of Conan O'Brien <laughs> as a Terminator. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Okay, sorry. No worries. Um, but he, we were all very confused as to why he was on stage, and he went on the little ramble before he said he was going to introduce the biggest movie star today, and he introduced Tom Cruise, who came on stage and basically talked about how for decades people have been asking him for a sequel to this beloved movie, and it's a movie that has long tied been tied to San Diego. He shot a couple scenes in a restaurant just across the street from the convention center. Yeah, we drove by that the other day, and I pointed yeah. it out to Jacob. Yeah, yeah that, was, that was cool. Yeah, so um, it was a very fitting sort of uh, introduction, and he introduced Top Gun Maverick, and we saw the first trailer for this movie. And that trailer is now online, so it everybody is. can see it. I have not seen it yet because I've been busy running around San Diego. I don't like Top Gun, but it's a good trailer. It's a good trailer? <laughs> yeah, it's a good trailer. Um, it, it feels like it's really following the Mission Impossible route of putting the camera in places where it's making very clear Tom Cruise is actually in the cockpit of fighter planes. It's, and it's um, kind of bowled over by the aerial, aerial photography in this trailer. Uh, since everybody can see this at home, uh, you know, you can go watch it, but did they say anything more about the movie? Did we learn anything? Uh, from Tom Cruise's introduction or from the trailer? From, from he just gave an introduction and yeah. there was like no other intro? Nothing. The trailer played and that was it. We did learn something from the trailer, such that um, uh, Tom Cruise's character uh, was has not been promoted for the 20, 30 years since he's been there. And it's a, it's a position as captain that he wanted to keep ever since he uh, attained that position. Yeah, Ed Harris playing Ed Harris, his opening voiceover <laughs> where he says, like, you know, you could have been an animal by now, but you're not, you know. Uh, so, and then cue Tom Cruise smiling with a little jacket on, and he grabs his sunglasses, <laughs> and the music kicks on, and even somebody like me who has no love for Top Gun, I was like, yeah, Top Gun, yeah. <laughs> See, I was only excited about the recreation of the volleyball scene. <laughs> Yes, the shirtless Tom Cruise playing volleyball again. Yes. Looking more cut now than he did in the 80s. Wait, so this is, does this feel more self-aware than the original Top Gun? I have no idea, man. Uh, I it, 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 it clearly uh, is aware of the iconography because it, it's leaning very heavily on some familiar things. Uh, but the aerial photography alone makes this look like it's a different class than the original movie ever was. Okay, let's move on to Batman Beyond. This is the 20th, in, 20th anniversary panel. HD, you were there. You're a big fan of this animated series, and as, as was I. Uh, what did they announce there? So they announced the release of the first remastered Blu-ray sets that will be coming this October, and that will be a uh, they'll also be accompanied by a Funko Pop of a Chrome Batman Beyond, and um, these are going to be remastered all uh, fifty um, fifty two episodes of the series. Is, are included in this Blu-ray, but only 41 will be fully remastered with the rest of the 11 um, given up res makeover because they didn't have either the time or the budget to do all of them. Um, That's strange It is a little bit me. strange, but uh, they do will include the film The Return of the Joker, which featured Mark Hamill in returning as the, uh, the Joker, um, and um, it will be an un- cut an unrated version as well, uh, as well as 1,500 hours worth of features and bonus features. 1,500 hours? I think so, yeah. It was uh, quite a lot. Wait, that can't be. It was, it was in the press 1,500 release. minutes? Oh, 1,500 minutes, maybe. Okay, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 1,500, yeah, because 1,500, I don't think you could fit that on the blue. Well, me? Uh, no, I don't no, think that, you can. That, you know, let's go ahead and Hold see on. 1,500 minutes. 1,500 minutes. <laughs> okay. Uh, I was just very excited for all the new <laughs> special features. So there you have it. Uh, because, HD, I don't think you... 1,500 hours. How many days is that? That's many days. That's, yeah. that's, that's many weeks. Yeah, we'd be losing HD for like a month. <laughs> you would not hear from me again. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it looks cool? Yes, it does look cool. They showed some of the side-by-side comparisons 
of the old original series, which first debuted in 1999, and the remastered versions. Um, this will be coming on digital October 15th and in a box set on October 29th. Um, the box set will be $99, $99, $100 total. And um, that is, uh, that it was really exciting. They came out with um, Will Friedel and Ken, Kevin Conroy, who voiced uh, uh, Terry McGinnis and uh, Bruce Wayne in the series, as well as some of the producers and the casting director, and talked about some of the behind the scenes and uh, the making of the series and how they wanted to do a sort of fresh take on the hit series that was Batman the Animated Series, but not do this, something similar. Uh, so they came up with this cyberpunk neo-noir that was um, definitely take a sort of a radical departure from the original series. So um, it was really cool, and I was I was excited to hear about this box set, and this is the yeah. first remastered version of the series since it first came out. We'll have to wait until they can remaster all 52 or 50, whatever it is. Um, okay, we've been talking about things that have been kind of exciting. I want to bring things down a little bit. Jacob... <laughs> What is the worst thing you saw today? Oh, uh, the worst thing I saw today. Um, it's not even. Bad. Or, or, wait, before we get to that, yeah. talk about the bill that that bus stop you saw. <sighs> <laughs> oh yeah, speaking of Batman, uh, there is. I was walking by a uh, bus stop that the ad space on both sides had been bought by people uh, who wanted to see the release of the Snyder Cut hashtag release the Snyder Cut, and one side said in big words, uh, "Did you know that?" Justice League was three and a half hours long, featured Dark Seed, um, Dark Side, however you announce his name these days, released the Snyder Cut. Their side was this extremely long paragraph explaining okay. how, On a billboard. <laughs> how Zack Snyder was removed from Justice League, uh, and had a bunch of like shots from the trailers that were in a final movie, like spliced on the bottom, like saying before and after, before and after. And it was just all the, from his like Vero account. They like copied and pasted. I'm not sure from Vero from just the early trailers yeah. before they, you know, before he yeah. was removed from the or left the film. And just, I try to, pe- people kept saying that like they raised a bunch of money to put up these release center cut billboards. And people said, but they used the excess funds to, um, Put, put towards suicide awareness in honor of Zack Snyder's daughter who committed suicide. I'm thinking, don't use that excuse. You, 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 don't, you, don't, you donate all of your money to suicide awareness if you actually mean that. You're just trying to yeah. put a nice coat of candy on your bullshit campaign. Get this, I'm, I'm oh. done why this. not raise... Uh, here's a better idea. Instead of getting this billboard, why not raise like a million dollars for this cause and then put a website up and like send letters to Warner Brothers. Look what we did in honor of this and we want we really want this movie yeah it's almost like people want the Snyder Cut aren't actually interested in helping people it's almost like that Peter <laughs> it's funny to me too that they raise it up here uh, in, in Comic Con in San Diego when Warner Brothers isn't even at Comic Con this year <laughs> at least not with anything super early yeah, yeah. okay uh, Jacob what is the worst thing you saw inside the convention center today uh, I was I saw it at the Indigo Ballroom so technically it was not in the convention center oh well uh. in, in a in a ballroom what it's yeah. and to be fair, it wasn't terrible. It was just lifeless, and that was a ABC's new series, Emergence, which has a good taste to cast uh, Fargo star Allison Tolman in the lead, and Clancy Brown plays her father. But no amount of you know cool character actors can make up the fact that this feels like it was it was a script taken from the mid two thousands rush to mimic lost success with all those half baked you know uh, mystery. mystery shows. And the gist here is that Alice Holman's small town uh, sheriff finds a little girl inside of a plane crash who's unharmed. She has amnesia. And won't you know it, there are government agents after her. And she can maybe control machines. Oh no, is there a, what's going on here? That's the show. And so, so wait, this is Stranger Things meets, uh, what's that uh, That show with the plane that disappeared and reappears? Who the hell knows? And the uh, other that Flash sh- Forward? No, that, no, that was another uh, not lost yeah. knockoff. There are a lot of them. Yeah. Uh, so it just seems like a copy of a copy of a copy. Yeah, I, it, was, it was. It was like, it was like eating last week's lasagna. Like I, I've, I've had this better. I've had it fresher. And look, I'm really happy to see Allison Tolman collecting a paycheck. You know, leading it. If Allison Tolman is like an amazing actress, and she is paying her rent, great. But you know, I want to see her in non ABC TV shows. <laughs> Well, it could be worse. She could be in a CBS TV show. Well, that's a good point. No, I'd say we're kind of blessings here. Okay. Speaking of ABC, HD, you went to the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. panel. Yes. 
this was kind of a victory lap for Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., if you can call it a victory lap. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was kind of harsh. I did watch Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. for a good amount of time. Um, yeah, but... you're the one person on the staff that, like, always sticks up for Agents of I S.H.I.E.L.D. I did. It's yeah, not, you don't still watch it. It's not a bad show, but I also stopped watching it, so I can't defend, like, its later seasons. I don't know if they got better or worse. But um, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Um, recently revealed that it was ending its run with its seventh season. It's currently airing its sixth season right now. So this... This um, panel was a way of them to sort of say goodbye to their fans and uh, reminisce about the past seven years of um, a TV show that has no connection to the Marvel Cinematic <laughs> Universe whatsoever. But uh, it was kind of a glorified clip show because um, they brought in the main cast, which includes uh, Clark Gregg, Ming-Na Wen, Chloe Bennett, um, Elizabeth Henstridge, um, and uh, they came to talk on um, to talk about just like their memories of making the series while they aired uh, a just kind of cut together clips from each season. So they would be like roll the clips and they would roll a, um, a summary of season one. And Jeff Loeb, who was uh, moderating, would um, just ask them about the uh, what the process. And uh, Jed Whedon and Marissa Tartaran, who are the showrunners, were also there and. Um, it was quite emotional, so I did feel like, you know, some tugging on the heartstrings, but I also haven't seen it in a while. Um, it did, and it was nice to go back to the earlier seasons and remember that seasons two through four were genuinely good TV. I was like, wow, they were doing some bold things here. Um, <laughs> like, you know, alternate dimensions, uh, this one great standalone episode with Elizabeth Hendricks' character where she gets stuck on a desert planet for a full episode, and it's just her. It's a good, just, bottle episode with her. It was very good, like, tight writing. Um, so it was um, it was cool to see that, but uh, it didn't really amount to much news. They just talked yeah. about how they did their last table read uh, just this past Friday, and that they're going to start shooting season seven next week. You know, it's funny to hear you enthused about the show, and <laughs> usually Jacob gets excited about, like, you know, some kind of anime you bring up, and you can just tell Jacob's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. was my laundry folding show for about two seasons, and then, uh, then my wife started doing laundry for me because she bought a new washer dryer, and I'm very excited about it, so I stopped watching Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Yeah, I mean, like, I do, I do like, lots of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., but I did stop watching in season five, I think, yeah. when... I feel like I went a little bit off the rails. It was trying a little too hard to introduce the inhuman and Kree storylines in yeah. a way that just kind of lost the plot. So, um, but you know, I'm glad that they're finishing their run on a high note, I guess, and having a victory lap for the fans. Let me guess: the fans were asking, "Will this collide with the MCU?" They did, and they were like. Who knows? It's all connected. Wow. Were you there, Peter? Because that's exactly what they said. <laughs> um, you know what? While you guys were in all those panels, I was over at Ballroom 20. I saw a bunch of panels I'm not going to talk about. But I uh, did see the panel for Co Cobra Kai. And as you know, this is one of my favorite shows. The first season was one of my favorite things of that year. And they, they actually don't have anything to show here because they just aired season two. And uh, they haven't started filming season three, but I, I think they're deep in the writing of that. And they did reveal some interesting stuff here. So um, the one of the showrunners, Josh Heald, uh, revealed that season three is a lot about how to move forward in that construct and find the Cobra Kai and Miyagi-Do sides of our journey are moving inwardly. And he said... We dig a little into the origin story of both Miyagi-Do and Cobra Kai, and in that journey, we will see Daniel LaRusso return to Okinawa. Mm -hmm. So that's the big news from that panel, that we're going to see <laughs> Ralph Macchio <laughs> return to Okinawa. Uh, we saw that in the Karate Kid Part three or Part 2. Uh, that's when Daniel went to Okinawa with um, his karate teacher, Mr. Uh, Mr. Miyagi, who uh, his... Uh, father was dying or something like that and uh his return spark re-sparked in a rivalry of you know lifelong rivalry and uh in the end of that film if you don't remember <laughs> the end of that film there was this ceremonial like thing at a castle and uh Sato, the guy that uh, Mr. Miyagi was feuding with, his nephew basically takes uh, the girl that Daniel loves hostage and 
creates this karate fight. This karate fight <laughs> must happen. And Sato, who was saved by Mr. Miyagi and, and Daniel uh, in a typhoon because... See, even they describing the, this movie is just insane. I've only ever seen the first Karate Kid. Only... So what you're describing sounds like it went from Rocky 1 to Rocky 4 in two movies. <laughs> it did. and it, Yeah, but anyway, so I'm not sure if Sato is going to be there. He was pretty old in that, that movie, but I'm sure Chosen, uh, his nephew, might be involved. And they also asked, uh, during these first two seasons, they've been kind of hinting that Elizabeth Shue would be involved as Allie. Allie was the girlfriend of Johnny and then Daniel <laughs> later on. Uh, and uh, they've been hinting at that, and basically people asked, and they were like, we can't say. And I'm assuming that's because there's no contract signed yeah. at this point. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm excited for Cobra Kai. I'm not sure if I'm excited that they're going to be returning. I mean, Okinawa is kind of cool, but that was also probably the, no, I was going to say it was the worst of Karate Kid, but that's not even true. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I have no context for this because I've, I've also only seen the first Karate Kid. And yes, your yeah. description of the second one is quite bonkers. It is, yeah, it was, it's more bonkers. Yeah, yeah, it's bonkers. And someone also did a, also ask that uh, they had the next Karate Kid. I'm not sure if you saw that one, Jacob. No. But that was with Hillary, Hillary Swank as the Karate Kid. And they asked if that is canon. And they said it was because Mr. Miyagi, anything with Mr. Miyagi is canon. Although, does that mean that the animated adventures of Karate Kid, where they're like traveling around the world, fighting ancient evils? The answer is yes. I'm, I'm, I'm going to jump in here and say yes. yes. Um, but they did say it is canon. Uh, if and when she will ever appear, we'll have to see. Two-time Academy Award winner Hillary Swank appearing on a YouTube original. <laughs> you never know. You never know. Okay. Uh, anyways, back to, back to you, Jacob. Uh, we were talking about the worst thing you saw today. Let's now talk about the best thing you saw today. Yes, yeah, so, so the new Amazon Prime video series, uh, Undone, which I was curious about because it is created by... Uh, Bojack Horseman creator Bob, uh, Raphael Bob Waxberg and a one of his Bojack Horseman writers, Kate Purdy. And so, uh, and it's made by uh, Tornante, the same company that makes Bojack Horseman. And, and so I was very, very curious because that's such a strong pedigree. I think Bojack Horseman is a strip, one of the best shows on, t- on TV or streaming, whatever you want to call it these days. And so I went in not knowing much and I was bowled over by this series. I watched the first two episodes, uh, two half hour episodes. And I was straight up blown away by it. And it's a really, really hard so- show to even sell. So I think it's why they showed us two, because it really took two episodes for the show to really kind of reveal what it's really about. And Rosa Salazar, uh, who you may know from Elite of Battle Angel, is the lead character. And she is a young woman, late 20s, uh, battling depression and anxiety. She feels listless in her life. Her younger, her younger sister has gotten engaged. Her mother's always on her case. She, she's trying to avoid, you know, settling down with her boyfriend. And the first episode is very much this very funny, very sharp, very acidic uh, combination of comedy and drama. Very much like BoJack, actually, uh, except without the talking animals. But it has a very, very similar tone. Very, very uh, lived-in uh, characters who, who, whose predicaments are so specific that they feel universal. In the same way, like... When, it, when you try to write someone's problems as being relatable to everybody, they don't feel relatable at all. Or you write somebody's problems as being so granular and thought through and unique to them that you see yourself in that. And that's what the first episode really feels like. And I'm, the show buries a lead, but I won't here, which is that she's in a car accident and it triggers something in her mind where she becomes unstuck from reality. And, like, and either she's going crazy from brain trauma or... She has inherited an ability from her from her late grandmother to be able to experience time and space uh, in, in, in a way, in the order and presentation of her choosing. And she's told this information by her dead father, played by Bob Odenkirk, who appears to her uh, as a spiritual guide to teach her how to use her new abilities to traverse time and space and to solve his murder. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it is. Oh, and the whole thing is rotoscope animated. It is filmed with actors. Oh, wow. Uh, painted over. So that's, so, so that's the style of, like, Waking Life. Of Waking or... Life. Yeah, they did have a lot of the same people did Waking Life on this. The and Ralph uh, Bakshi, Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Uh, Scanner yeah. Darkly people are on this as well. And um, it's beautiful. The show is gorgeous to look at. Like, every frame is, like, just a beautiful painting. And uh, it and what's, what's so unique about the uh, roscoping is that it leans so heavily into capturing all the finer points and details of reality. 
that, you know, that the, it feels like it exists on this fine line that the scene between live action and animation to the point where like it, it looks like both at the same time so that when she is breaking from reality when she comes on a second time and like is like literally changing the universe around her or replaying a, a moment over and over again or like uh, the, the scenery around her like shatters like glass and she's in a new space when that does happen it's, almost, it's jarring and shocking because you're, you're so used to the, the reality of most of the scenes and the reality of the rotoscoping uh, making the animation feel so real that when the animation starts becoming unreal it is genuinely surprising to happen and um, in the Q&A Kate Purdy talked about how the show is inspired by her family members a family member who's schizophrenic and she has battled anxiety and depression and went on a tour trying to figure out if medicine was right for her or eastern philosophy and the show is, up, is going to use her on the spiritual journey as a metaphor for you know trying to find a way to um, you know, come to terms with your own mental illness, and, it, and so I am, I am going to be watching this show day one. The rest of it, I'm very excited. Wow, that sounds very up my alley. I've never seen BoJack Horseman, but wow, that's just that everything about that what you just said is appeals very specifically to me. I can't wait. Wait, I, I'm a logistics guy, <laughs> Jacob. I, I, I'm just. I have a que- I have a couple questions about yes. this. Like, so she travels through time can she affect time or is she just experience i don't want to say too much but there is a sequence in the second episode where she relives the same event um and rewinds time several times in order to get it right more or less groundhog day style uh so and the episode 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 two is very much makes it very clear that she's still learning what her capabilities are mm-hmm. and and it's, and it's like heavily suggested that like you know either she learns on master or she goes insane because people are just going to think that she's a crazy person. So it's, she's very much still learning and her, and her father makes it clear that, you know, he's going in the same way. He wasn't there for her in life. He's going to be there for her to help her learn how to master reality. Well, this sounds cool. Now this is something to put on our list. When does undone come on Amazon? Uh, I don't have those numbers in front of me, but I know it's this summer. It's, It's not far from now. Okay, cool. Um, HD, one of the, Films that you or one of the TV shows that you've been looking forward to a lot because I know you you were telling me even earlier today at breakfast that you read this uh, many times mm-hmm. over the years is His Dark Materials. Now that you you saw some of it, yeah, did you see more than the trailer that they released? Online? No, I, we just saw the trailer that they released online. But I will say I was very encouraged by the trailer, and yes. My entire my entire livelihood depends on this TV series <laughs> doing well. I really am invested in it and something that's very precious to me. And so I got to see the panel, which uh, included um, writer uh, Jack Thorne, who is best known for his Tony Award winning uh, adaptation of The Cursed Child for um, for Broadway and the West End, and. Um, Jane Tranter, who is the executive producer, as well as cast members Daphne Keene, James McAvoy, Lynn Man Miranda, and Ruth Wilson uh, for this panel. And um, they talked about the making of the series, and they kind of, they kind of went deep into more of its theological and philosophical uh, branches, which I found very encouraging because I felt like they have a very deep understanding of the characters, as I, as me and, and plenty of other historic materials fans know and love them. So um, the trailer that we saw, which they uh, showed right off the bat, uh, basically was... Wait, wait, much- before you talk about the trailer, oh. what is this book? Oh, okay, okay, yes. Because okay. there's probably many people like me. I mean, I did know the book because I knew the earlier mm-hmm. film adaptation, but... Right. So His Dark Materials is a trilogy that consists of The Golden Compass, The Subtle Knife, and The Amber Spyglass. And it's best described as Philip Pullman, the author's uh, sort of reversal of John Milton's Paradise Lost. It's his, it's his retelling of this uh, sort of biblical story, but with um, a more feminist twist of a theandum and a different kind of interpretation of what original sin is. Um, that's as far as I can say without getting into spoilers okay. of like the deeper uh, story. But um, the story... The world that we're introduced to in The Golden Compass, the first book and the first series season that's uh, being adapted to the series, um, is set in an alternate world, an alternate Oxford, London, Oxford, England, um, in which um, people's souls live outside of them. 
and these are called demons, and they are the, in the form of animals. Once a person hits puberty, that um, demon settles into one permanent animal, and that usually is an indic indicator of what that person's personality um, subconscious is. Um, but up until then, they, the animals, the, the demons can shapeshift into any animal that they, that they want. Um, so it's, uh, they went into some really interesting conversations about the demon and the soul, but we'll talk about that a little later on. But, um, Lyra is the protagonist, played by Daphne Keene, who is an orphan raised by, uh, university professors. And, uh, her uncle, Lord Asriel, played by James McAvoy, is an explorer who, um, she stops an assassination attempt at the beginning of the series. And, um... After she stops this, this attempt, she kind of gets swept up in this vast conspiracy involving this tyrannical religious organization called the Magisterium, which includes the kidnapping of children for strange experiments that have to do with their demons. Mm. So she ends up um, trying to going on this journey to try to find her best friend who was kidnapped by this organization but uh, gets caught up in uh, with other sort of nefarious people, including Lord Avril, who has his own um, agenda, and Mrs. Coulter, who's played by Ruth Wilson, a woman who is the antagonist of this, but has um, is a very, very, very icy, unreadable character who has her own agenda as well. So it's a great... Um, sort of a uh, swashbuckling adventure story. It's just, if we're just talking about this first book right now, and that goes into the deep Arctic and deals with witches, talking bears, and yeah. um, all sorts of prophecies that have to do with Lyra. And where does Lin-Manuel Miranda fit into all this? He is a grizzled Texan aeronaut, a.k.a. <laughs> a hot, bu hot, hot air balloon uh, pilot? <laughs> Driver? Um, and he um, is a... Uh, so he becomes he befriends Lyra and helps her on the last leg of her journey. And he is uh, he's described by Lynn Miranda as a cowboy who gets into bar fights and drives an, uh, a hot air balloon. Hmm. Um, you know, this is one of the few trailers that came out today that I actually did see, and I was surprised at number one. You know, coming off of seeing Golden Compass, how much darker this looked, mm -hmm. and two. Uh, the scope and special effects of this just seem very impressive, which I guess probably shouldn't impress me after Game of Thrones from HBO, but it just was like seeing that, uh, what is that, polar bear? Yes. That's, yeah. that's the talking polar bear I was talking about. Yeah. York Bernstein, who becomes a pivotal character later on, too. So what, what did you, having a love for th this book series, what did you think? I was really encouraged by this trailer. I've been a little bit wary because... Uh, Tom Hooper directs the first few episodes of this series, <laughs> and his is a visual style I'm not quite fond of. I think his style, while very solemn, isn't very suited towards such a rich, lavish world as we see in his Dark Materials. Um, and I think that he has a fondness too much for close-ups and kind of just very plain um, images. But um, I was encouraged by this because... Uh, there are some really striking imagery um, in the series that we see. So there's something that's like a little bit more like beyond just like his usual prestige work. And um, we also see um, some of the sort of clinical imagery that uh, fits the um, the sort of experimental uh, experimentation storyline that we see later on. Um, and while it is dark and it does kind of uh, go into his uh, tendency to go really deep into close-ups, I feel like that's a BBC thing too. Yeah. Um, I think the darkness kind of fits the the first book's story. It is a more like intimate, um, straightforward adventure story. Uh, something in which Lyra is looking for something and then being hunted. So it kind of the dark tone does mesh in a sense. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't saying it's a bad thing. It <laughs> just like it seemed. I mean, we talked earlier today at breakfast about how that that other film was film adaptation was kind of neutered yes. in many ways. Yes. And th this seems like more gritty and more, or more closer to the source material. Yes. And, um, the idea, the concepts of religion and like the, um, the issue of religion was actually addressed in this panel. Um, uh, the executive, executive producer, Trancher, she talked about how, um, this, she wanted to clarify that this series isn't about the Catholic church because that was the big controversy that this, that, 
his Dark Materials originally drew, in that um, the magisterium, the tyrannical um, and oppressive author- authoritarian uh, religious organization was a parallel or an analog for the Catholic Church, and that's why... Wait, that- who, why would anybody draw those connections <laughs> at all? I can't... I, I have no, no idea. idea. But it's partially what tanked the 2007 film. New Line was so intimidated by the bro- the threats from the Catholic Church of boycott and everything that they ended up just cutting out large sections of the story and and tried to go for something that was like a little more typical of that children's fantasy story. Um, but here it seems like it's really leaning into it. But it's not. She wanted to clarify. It's not just about the Catholic Church. It is about. Um, that idea of control and how an, a, a totalitarian government or or organization can you know, use that control to twist it to their own means. Okay, we have one last thing to talk about today. Uh, Jacob, you saw Stumptown? Uh, By the way, what what is Stumptown? Because I don't even know what that is. Uh, Stumptown is the uh, ABC TV adaptation of the Oni comic book series written by Greg uh, Rucka. And I'm a big fan of comic and... I'm not completely sold in the show. We did, we only saw a few minutes of it, uh, but I did mostly like what I saw. The comic itself is about a a uh, Afghanistan uh, veteran uh, played in the show by Colby Smulders, who uh, returns home. Uh, bills are piling up. She can't pay the rent. Trying to take care of her younger brother, and so she becomes a private investigator and starts uh, trying to solve crimes around Portland, you know, aka Stumptown, where the, where the show gets its title, and. What makes the comic special is that there aren't a lot of, you know, straightforward procedural private investigator comic book so- series. So it's, when you're reading, it's like, oh, this is actually a, kind of a comfort food genre. You're watching a smart character solve mysteries, and you know she's a soldier, she's not a superhero, so she's very scrappy, she's, she's smart, but she's not a genius. So you're watching this, you know, capable person struggle her way through mysteries in a way that's incredibly satisfying. But that describes so many TV shows. I don't know how you, you know, adapt it into a show and keep what makes the comic special, keep it that lived-in feeling, keep the feeling of Portland, keep the characters, you know, uh, feeling as special as they do. So we, we saw a few, we saw two clips. We saw one clip, which was the opening scene in the first episode, which actually has the wit and the grit of the comic uh, really on display, which is uh, filmed in Portland, or at least this sequence was, two low lives are driving a car through the Portland streets, and they're talking about artisanal coffee. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And in the background, you hear someone screaming and thumping from the trunk and trying to ignore it. And then uh, Colby Smulders breaks through the back seat from the trunk where they've been keeping her with a fire extinguisher, sprays them, crawls out and starts fighting them all in this car as swerving across the lanes. And, and none of them are very good fighters, so it's just very messy, you know, fight. And then um, they're swerving in and out of traffic and in a really funny beat. Colby Smulders starts pointing out, but how about they're about to get a car accident? So they stop fighting for a second to pull the car out of the way. And it ends with the car driving off the road, hitting a ramp and flying through the air. Freeze frame. Stumptown, Stumptown appears on, on the um, still image of the car frozen in the air. And I said, hell yeah, I'm in for Stumptown. Uh, it, it, was, it was a very, very fun, capable opening scene. How many hooked us? They had to play the rest of it right now. I'd sit through the rest of it. But they didn't play the rest of it. They, it was mostly a panel. They're filming it right now. The showrunner wasn't even there because they're literally, uh, he's too busy to be there. Um, they did show a promo sizzle reel after that, about 30 seconds long of additional footage from the pilot. And it was filmed very much in a, coming soon to ABC, look at this generic looking show with no personality. So I'm really, really hoping the final show is as fun and quirky and, uh, you know, full of personality as the clip was, because ABC is clearly going to sell it as a very generic, you know, procedural mystery solving show. Yeah. Well, that's a shame because it feels like you need to market it like that to get the people that want to see something like that. Yeah. And if you're just trying to market to the typical ABC people, then you're going to get the wrong people interested in the wrong show, and then nobody's going to be happy. Yeah, and like I said, I really like the comic, and the show's success. I mean, the comic keeps going because Greg Rucka doesn't – it's not ongoing. He writes like a five-issue version, a five-issue miniseries of it, waits a couple of years, writes another five-issue miniseries of it. So there's only been like, you know, four miniseries. And if the show's a success, that means more Stumptown for a while. So I'd like to read more Stumptown. So watch Stumptown. Hope it's good. Fingers crossed. Okay, that brings us to the end of today's episode. I, I do want to say uh, yesterday I mentioned that I recorded a video blog on the show floor showing you all of the the preview night 
Uh, that is now online. I'll link it in the show notes. You can find more of all of our work at SlashFilm.com. We're here at Comic-Con covering it, so we're having updates throughout the weekend. So if you want to know what's happening, uh, you know, keep on refreshing that site. And uh, this podcast, Slash Film Daily, is published every weekday. This week it might be published every day on iTunes, Google, Overcast, Spotify, all the popular podcast apps. Please feel free to send us your feedback, questions, comments, concerns to peter at slash com, And please head on over to iTunes, give us a rating, give us a review, tell your friends, spread the word, and we'll see you tomorrow.